From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Cloudflare repels another record DDoS attack, security leaders rank cyber priorities for 2022, and Kaiser Permanente attack exposes customer data. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, some opinion, and most definitely some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Ariel Weintraub, the CISO at Mass Mutual. Ariel, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Before we get on, we have to, of course, thank our sponsor, Datadog, detect and respond to threats across dynamic systems. Remember, you can join us on LinkedIn Live, get in on the conversation during the show. To do so, go to CISOseries.com, look for the Week in Review page, you can find the link there. We are not going to wait for you, however, I just have to warn you, full disclosure, because we only have 20 minutes, and let's get into the show. First up here, Cloudflare repels another record DDoS attack. Cloudflare mitigated a distributed denial of service attack, I guess for people that aren't in the know, with a record peak traffic of 26 million requests per second. This attack proved 51% larger than the previous record set back in August. What makes this attack unique is its scale. Usually we see huge DDoS attacks using hundreds of thousands of low power IoT devices and even still seeing traffic much smaller than this. However, this attack originated from seemingly hijacked servers of cloud service providers using a smaller botnet of just over 5,000 devices. The DDoS targeted a customer on Cloudflare's free tier. So kudos for Cloudflare, they didn't make any money and they still deflected that DDoS. It looks like the DDoS stakes have been raised here, Ariel, by using these cloud service providers. Is this how it looks to you or is this just another DDoS event in your book? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, DDoS attacks are leveraging botnets and botnets are opportunistic in nature. They don't really care what they're taking advantage of, right? So I think it's just really taking advantage of what it can find, where they can get the most bang for their buck, essentially. The botnet doesn't know necessarily what where it's originating from, doesn't care where it's originating from, it doesn't care where it's owned, doesn't care if it's you know free or, or paid or whatever. It's really <laughs> all about taking advantage of that opportunistic nature of it. So I think what we're seeing is, one, just a bigger wave of DDoS attacks altogether. I think DDoS, for whatever reason, tends to happen in waves. We see it spike, you know, for a couple months. It tends to be the, you know, the attack of choice for for a little while. Sometimes using um, for extortion purposes. Sometimes for just to knock the site offline. Um, but for whatever reason, right now we seem to be seeing another wave of DDoS attacks. We were seeing, you know, especially with the, um, you know, recent war in Ukraine, we were seeing more destructive malware before. And now we're again seeing more DDoS. So not really sure, you know, why we're seeing that uh, shift in trend. But I don't think it really has anything to do with the the cloud service providers themselves. I think it's just again the opportunistic nature of a botnet being taken advantage of for getting the most value out of the attack. All right. Well, moving on here, security leaders rank cyber priorities for 2022. ForgePoint Capital surveyed U.S. security and technology executives to determine C-suite cybersecurity priorities for the remainder of 2022. Three quarters of respondents indicated they expect security budgets to increase in 2022. Top initiatives included securing cloud infrastructure and APIs with 62 percent, DevSecOps at 54 percent, identity management 41 percent, and data management 40%. Sorry, data management. Respondents from small and medium-sized businesses also indicated they're prioritizing addressing supply chain risk, social engineering awareness, and talent development. That supply chain seems like a big ask for small and medium businesses. But Ariel, this looks like a good shopping list overall. I mean, we're we're not seeing, you know, we're seeing a lot of cutback on spend and and, uh, some other tech sectors and a lot of other, uh, uh, you know, kind of across the industry, not security spend. So it seems like we're in line there. Is there anything that you're seeing, though, missing or under prioritized in this list? Well, first, I think it's just interesting to separate it out by the size of the company, because I think a lot of times we think there's this one size fits all approach, right, for cybersecurity programs. And and in reality, that's not the case. Um, I think the list makes sense, but maybe what's missing is the kind of back to basics, you know, general IT hygiene, um, best security practices, especially with, you know, there's a a new fancy vulnerability of the day, kind of every week at this point, they're all dubbed, you know, little cutesy names and nowhere in this list of um, initiatives is really that that back to basics hygiene, right? It's mm-hmm. a combination of security hygiene through vulnerability management, as well as partnering with the IT organizations to ensure you're cleaning up your tech debt. And when these cutesy you know, vulnerabilities are disclosed that you have the proper 
protocols and also automation in place to be able to respond quickly. So beyond that, I mean, I do think that these are great initiatives to focus on, especially with the further adoption of cloud. And, and that would depend on the size of the organization and how much of the environment is more on-prem versus all, you know, all cloud-based. And uh, I do think data management is important. So uh, sorry, data management as well. <laughs> oh, poor data management. The one thing that stood out to me is, I guess, seeing the extension of I guess that whatever the hybrid work, remote work boom that we've had, you know, kind of, okay, we want to invest money in securing cloud and API, which are increasing under use and identity management, you know, kind of, kind of uh, analogous to that trend as well. All right, uh, our next story here, Kaiser Permanente attack exposes customer data. Kaiser Permanente has warned that threat actors may have stolen sensitive, personally identifiable information of nearly 70,000 customers. The not-for-profit healthcare provider claims to have terminated the attack within hours. The breach occurred through an employee's account, and that employee has been provided with additional security training and not fired, so I'm glad for that employee. While patient names and medical records were potentially accessed, the company believes that social security numbers and credit card info was not exposed. You know, Ariel, when we see high-profile accounts in healthcare or finance get hacked, the announcements these very carefully worded you know, statements may have stolen. The company believes that those kind of uh, a little bit of phraseology there. Uh, so, you know, saying that data may have been exposed, but not really putting a ton of stock in that. Is it fair to customers, shareholders, regulators to use these soft terms, uh, at least in the news cycle? I mean, it seems like that's something that they can get away with. But as everyday users, we kind of have to w w across security or, or our lives, we have to make much more definitive statements, right? I mean, I think that's fair. But on the other hand, you can only definitively prove that the data was compromised and and or was, you know, used nefariously. You can't mm -hmm. prove that it wasn't. So the lack of evidence in a forensic in investigation that the data was accessed or exfiltrated doesn't necessarily prove that it wasn't. So you see what I'm saying? You can only yeah, definitively yeah. say that it was. And so um, not a lawyer, but I'm kind of sounding like a lawyer in this response. <laughs> I, I do think that it's it's it, it's it's what we have to do, I think, to um, provide some amount of confidence that we understand what we're doing in our incident response. But we can't with 100 percent certainty say um, that the data wasn't compromised and therefore we have to say it may have been. And I think that's why we're also seeing more and more disclosures in the news and more reporting of breaches, because I do think historically it was more of the opposite, where unless you proved that it was compromised, companies didn't necessarily notify and disclose. And now I think we're seeing the pendulum sw switch to the other direction, swing to the other direction, where if there was any indication that that might have happened, and again, you can't prove that it didn't happen, then we have to do that. So I think your reaction is fair, and consumers, I think, have the right to, to, to ask that question. But unfortunately, the, we just don't always have their appropriate forensics to prove otherwise. Yeah, the I, I, the only concern with that from a like an endpoint, like as myself being an endpoint perspective on that is like kind of a numbing effect to that where it's like, increasingly, you know, if you're, if you're signed up for Have I Been Pwned or something like that, it seems like once a month, you're getting an email that you're you were in some, you know, pay spin or something like that. And the may have been impacted of that, I think, for for people that aren't up on this as much can feel a little numbing at times. But with health information, you know, again, they kind of don't have much of a choice, I guess. Better to be safe than sorry. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, our next story here, ransomware decryptors now for sale on gaming platforms. Last Thursday, researchers identified threat actors selling a decryptor for a new ransomware on the Roblox gaming platform using the service's in-game currency called Robux. Ask a teenager about it. The ransomware called Wanna Friend Me impersonates the Ryuk ransomware, but is actually a variant of a strain called Chaos, which is a do-it-yourself ransomware builder for wannabe criminals. The decryptor is being sold for around 1,500 Robux by a user named iRazorMind, but only smaller files can be decrypted because Wanna Friend Me deletes files larger than two megabytes. I guess being ransomware is not enough. You have to also be a jerk. So Ariel, does this sound like a pump and dump scheme to you? A quick low budget attempt to sell decryptors for cash or is there more here to look at? 
Well, first I asked my three-year-old if he had heard of this platform and he hadn't. So I'm not sure how significant it is since he doesn't know about it. But that said, I think actually what we are seeing is a result of sanctions being um, put on other types of cryptocurrency. And so um, a lot of extortion through ransomware in the past has been done through Bitcoin, which now has better you know, tracking and um, sanctions are more readily um, applied. And, and even beyond that, other cryptocurrencies now or there's more ability to trace back and do attribution and therefore sanctions are coming into play more. So this to me sounds like a creative way to get around some of that and to leverage other platforms that aren't regulated yet <laughs> to be able to incentivize the victims to to pay. Now that said, the um, the threshold for the size kind of, I think, defeats the purpose and, and to I mean, I don't think the ransom operators are, get, are getting it right because they seem to keep um, losing the incentive for the consumer or for the victim really to to want to pay the the ransom. But I, I do think it is a bit more, um, uh, tar- you know, it, it, they're they're doing it on purpose, right, to to get around. I think some of these sanctions, in my opinion. It's a really good point. I hadn't uh, hadn't quite thought about that, but uh, I guess regulators aren't looking quite so hard at Robux as opposed to you know Bitcoin. To your point, maybe next year. Maybe next year. All right. uh, Before we move on to our next story, of course, we have to spend a few moments with our sponsor, Datadog. Check out Datadog's on-demand fireside chat with CTO Cormac Brady. Over the course of his 20-plus year career at Thomson Reuters, Cormac consistently built bridges between technical teams and in the process helped teams achieve superior results and earn himself senior leadership positions. Watch now at datadoghq.com slash CISO. And check out datadog.com slash CISO series to learn why Datadog is the premier pen test reporting and management platform. All right, exchange servers used to deploy Black Cat. Microsoft has reported seeing at least one threat actor successfully infiltrating a network through an unpatched exchange server, then exfiltrating information in a typical double extortion ransomware scheme. We wouldn't be reporting on it if it had just stopped there, though. Two weeks after that initial compromise, it used the same server to launch Black Cat ransomware payloads across the entire network. Microsoft's threat intelligence team said that while remote desktop and compromised credentials are typical vectors for ransomware, exchange servers are being increasingly used by attackers. It's unclear what exchange exploit was used or what ransomware affiliate carried out this named attack by Microsoft. We didn't really go into the details there, but Ariel, exchange servers play such a vital role in the large part of the affairs of the world. You know, just every it's ubiquitous. How serious do you find this to be? Well, my first reaction is why are these exchange servers um, exposed directly to the internet? <laughs> yeah, and that goes back to my earlier point about uh, proper hygiene. You know, you should be identifying what you have exposed to the internet and limiting that to just the key services that are needed. And I think oftentimes we see a lot of unnecessary services like exchange servers that can be easily exploited in some cases being exposed unnecessarily. And so I think it's significant in that you're right. There are this does play a key role in in most enterprises. But if you have proper hygiene in place, you have some additional layers of protection. So I think the organizations that are getting you know, um, compromise based on these are likely those that have architected it in such a way that, that they are exposing it directly to the internet. Yeah, I almost see the the ransom like the ransomware operator like rubbing their eyes and like can't believe that you know that when they're seeing like a, so, with some sort of exploit that can you know be easily overtaken like that that kind of access you know uh, it, nothing but trouble. Let's put it that way. All right, next up here, U.S. defense contractor discussing takeover of NSO hacking technology. L3 Harris, a U.S. defense contractor, is negotiating with NSO Group to potentially acquire its controversial Pegasus surveillance technology. The deal would also potentially include NSO transferring personnel to L3 Harris. Both U.S. and Israeli governments would need to approve the deal, which could prove challenging since the Biden administration banned NSO last year. One senior White House official is quoted as saying, such a, such a transaction, if it were to take place, raises serious counterintelligence and security concerns from the U.S. government. NSO would clearly be a jewel in the crown of of any government's uh, spyware apparatus, but it would take it would just come with a raft of problems, political and otherwise. I'm curious, Ariel, what is your take on this idea of NSO being potentially adopted in the U.S. as well as being actually in the hands of a contractor? I mean, I think it's a little scary. Um, NSO tools have historically kind of been used for targeted surveillance for, you know, news reporters and journalists um, against high profile individuals in particular. But it, ne- it hasn't really been a threat to the broader 
IT community. And I think if the tools were available, you know, from the government or for other purposes in, in the hands of new people, I think it could just um, make the tools more commoditized. Whereas right now they're not really, you know, e easily um uh, e easy for kind of any hacker, if you will, to take advantage of them. So I, I think it's it it is a, an important um, uh, decision for I think the the government intentionally to make about how they leverage it. On the one hand, it could provide certain uh, opportunities for um, national security, but with that always comes what's the flip side of that? Will we um, will, will they unnecessarily be leaked for other purposes and then again commoditized? So. You know, there was an article that came out a couple months ago that talked about um, how the NSO tools are leveraging these zero click techniques and it made it seem like they're that they're everywhere right now and then everyone's vulnerable. But the reality is that people don't, you know, general hackers don't have access to those tools. And so it was really just more, you know, those high profile targeted people that needed to be worrying about it. But you kind of wonder if this technique could really pose a broader risk to to the Internet, if you will, if potentially the tools became um, more readily accessible. Yeah, the, the more people that have them, the higher likelihood that, so, you know, some there's some backdoor, someone gets in and, and that source code gets out there and then the genie's out of the bottle, right? Exactly. All right. Uh, next up here, ransomware gang creates site for victims to search for their stolen data. On Tuesday, the Alf v. Black Cat ransomware operation began releasing sensitive data that they claim was stolen from guests at over uh, and over 1,500 employees of the hotel and spot of a hotel and spot in Oregon. The ransomware gang took its tactics to a new level by creating a dedicated website, allowing victims and presumably anyone else to confirm whether their data was stolen. The gang will only remove data from the site upon receiving ransom payment from the victims. MSOSOFT security analyst Brett Callow said, while it's an innovative approach, it remains to be seen whether the strategy will be successful. And of course, that will determine whether it becomes more commonplace. Uh, Ariel, this has a definite wallet inspector ring to it. Just curious what your thoughts are. I just think it's so stupid. I mean, <laughs> the, the point of extortion, and that's a key part of ransomware, is to incentivize your victim to pay you the ransom. And one of the key points of that is that you don't want your, your downstream victim's data to be disclosed. But the minute you already disclose it, what's the point now in paying that ransom, right? It's already <laughs> out there. And, and they say, oh, we'll delete it. Well, you can delete it from the internet. The, the copies still exist, right? So I think it's probably one of the, the most stupid things I've heard in terms of trying to incentivize someone to pay it. I mean, I can't see any organization actually paying the ransom because at that point, especially for a regulated entity, the data has already been disclosed, so you now have to notify all of your impacted people, uh, you know, customers, and you have probably are going to be fined regardless. So well, I don't know what's the point at, at this point. Like, you're not trying to. You're now you're just you know um, embarrassing your victim, but you're never going to get paid, and that's the point, I think. Yeah, it, it, this almost seems like this is the lure to get me to click on a phishing email almost, where, right? Where it's like, we have this database of all your data, click on this link to find it. But then it's like, it actually exists, which doesn't make, to your point, doesn't kind of make any sense in the whole ransomware thing. So it, a, a weird move. But again, uh, I, I feel like ransomware operators feel like they have to get more creative <laughs> to, to get, even if it disincentivizes people the way you would think. So truly bizarre. Yeah, back to the whiteboard ransomware operators. <laughs> Come on, you could try harder. Come on. I'm disappointed. I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. All right, our final story here. Oh, my God. There's more to – oh, my God. Researchers from Wiz, who previously found four serious flaws in Azure's Open Management Infrastructure, or OMI, which they – uh, which which uh, they've called Oh My God, presented some report, uh, related news at RSA. Pretty much every cloud provider is installing similar software without customers' awareness or explicit consent. They say this comes in the form of middleware that bridges a customer's VMs and the provider's other managed services. They're needed to enable advanced VM features, things like log collection, automatic updating, and configuration syncing. But they also add potential new attack services because 
Customers don't know about them and they can't be defended against. Wiz has published a GitHub page that lists 12 agents installed secretly, things like OMI, on Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud, but says that there are likely more. Ariel, given the history of events like SolarWinds Orion, maybe it's not great news to discover unauthorized middleware being deployed. How serious do you find this? I think it further highlights the need for transparency. It is it is really serious. Um, mm-hmm. With the SolarWinds event, you know, um, it brought to light a new discipline that people are calling software bill of materials, which is also like understanding what's embedded in all of your your software. But in this case, it's not necessarily the software. It's more around um, the supply chain and or the the pr- the business process, I guess, if you will, of what the service pro- service provider is providing you. So I think the key here is that what all of these um, discoveries are uncovering is the need for service or offer providers to be more transparent, not only in their code, but their whole stack, right? Like what, what do they actually have employed? And I guess my my buzzword today is hygiene because then it goes back to good hygiene of ensuring that you have appropriate um, pro- protocols or automation in place to quickly patch and identify vulnerable components. But it is significant because the perimeters of what we're responsible for keep expanding, right? We no longer have full control over all the components that are in our ecosystem that are means for individual enterprises to be compromised. We have to rely on our third parties and our suppliers to also be performing good hygiene so that we're not downstream compromised. So I think it is um, quite serious. Yeah, and, and the 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 rub of it is, I think almost every organization would say, yes, this middleware is for the services it provides. If I knew about it, I would gladly accept this at, to get these additional services because those add value to my IT or whatever. But the the fact that they're not disclosed, then yet to, completely to your point. It prevents any kind of hygiene uh, to begin with. Admittedly, the whole point of these services is to some degree to to have a more hands-off approach, to have a more service-based approach. But at the end, stuff's still coming home to roost. You can't, you know, you, you need to be able to know what your exposure is uh, for many of these cloud providers. So it'll be interesting to see if we see any follow-up on this with, with more, you know, kind of that bill of goods uh, 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 methodology from those cloud providers for sure. All right. Before we get out of here, Ariel, was there any story that was a thumbs up or an eye roller for you? Well, big eye roll to the, the innovative approaches by that ransomware gang. Come on, guys. We can we can do better ransomware. I, I have high expectations for all of your criminal intent. All right, Ariel, before we get out of here, where can people find you uh, on cyberspace? And are you hiring? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn and we're always hiring. So even when we don't have an open position posted, we like to talk to new candidates to find top talent as they complement our our program and our strategy. So find me on LinkedIn. Well, Ariel Weintraub, the CISO at Mass Mutual, we have to have you back because this was phenomenal. Uh, Thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And of course, before we get out of here, we want to thank our sponsor, Datadog, detect and respond to threats across dynamic systems. Just a reminder, there will be no cybersecurity uh, Friday next week because instead we're going to be doing a, I'm sorry, a Super Cyber Friday Tuesday edition on June 28th at 2.45 p.m. Eastern during Living Security's Breaking Security Awareness Virtual Conference. Our title will be Hacking the Boardroom, How CISOs and Security Program Owners Can Better Approach and Get More Buy-In from the Board. Use and go to livingsecurity.com and click at the top of the screen to register. Of course, we'll be back with another week in review show starting as always, 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 1230 Pacific. And finally, you can get your daily news fix through cybersecurity headlines. It's every single day. It's about six minutes. Gets you in the know. Until next week, I'm Rich Straffolino reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines. 